Lineman safety is the watchword in the electric utility today. Despite the use of every type of improved protective device, electric shocks do occur, oft time through careless displacement of equipment. A daily inspection of rubber equipment is a must among most line crews today. Pole top resuscitation is intended to supplement the prone pressure method as an emergency measure under conditions where it is impossible to place the shock victim in the prone position quickly. Pole top resuscitation is a skill by means of which artificial respiration may be given to a lineman who, while working on a pole, receives an electric shock which suspends normal respiration. Resuscitation may thus be given immediately without delay usually involved in lowering the victim to the ground and in placing him in the prone position. By watching this instruction class in a public utility, much can be learned of the fundamentals of pole top resuscitation. Many companies have an especially equipped proving ground like this one for use and training purposes. Periodic practice classes of this type have proven very beneficial. The instructor is greeting a new man who has learned to climb and can therefore now attend the pole top resuscitation practice classes. Every man who uses spurs should have this knowledge of saving lives above the ground. Dave and Charlie are selected to demonstrate the proper position of the hands on the belly. The operator encircles with his arms the waist of the victim, placing both hands on the belly, thumbs below the lower ribs, and fingers touching. With his arms and hands, the operator compresses the victim's abdomen in an upward motion. At the finish of the upward stroke, the hands are cupped with the fingers depressing the belly under the breastbone. The instructor has Charlie remove his shirt in order to better demonstrate the cupping of the hands. The cupping of the hands is to prevent the hands from sliding apart and off the victim and is not for the purpose of giving localized center pressure. Extreme pressure must be avoided and localized pressure in the center is undesirable and will lessen the effectiveness of the resuscitation. Notice that the hands are gently but firmly restraining the outward movement of the belly at the sides. The object of the pole top technique is to raise the abdominal organs against the diaphragm in a manner so that pressure will be exerted on the diaphragm uniformly across the body. Thus the lungs are compressed and the air expelled. The pressure is then quickly released and reapplied at a frequency of 12 to 15 times per minute until the victim regains consciousness or is to be lowered to the ground. The general instructions and the first approach to the straddle position will now be demonstrated. The instructor requests the foreman to select the men for this demonstration. Dave and Charlie are again chosen. Charlie will take the position of the victim to demonstrate the first approach to the straddle position, while Dave will take the part of the rescuer. As the rescuer approaches, he observes the position of the victim and pole conditions, and in the safest way to himself, will proceed to administer pole top resuscitation. The operator who will administer artificial respiration takes a position on the pole below the victim, and after placing his safety strap around the pole at a point above the victim's spurs, proceeds to work his way upward with one leg of the victim on either side of his safety strap and with the victim's body between himself and the pole. The operator takes a step up and places the victim in position for resuscitation. The victim's safety strap should remain around the pole and can be effectively used by the operator as an aid in keeping the victim in the desired position. 
It should not be unsnapped or cut until the victim is to be lowered or is effectively supported by a hand line. Now we shall demonstrate the second approach to the straddle position. Experience has shown that other methods of placing the victim in position are practical and even preferred under some conditions. A common variation is the one leg overhead approach, wherein the rescuer puts his safety strap around the pole a little below the line of the victim's body belt. He then grasps one of the victim's legs and lifts it well above his head. He then swings the victim's body so that he passes his head under and between the victim's legs. The victim should now be astride the rescuer's safety belt. The rescuer then proceeds with resuscitation. In the first approach to the side saddle position, the rescuer places his safety strap around the pole on a line with the victim's hips. The rescuer then reaches down and takes hold of the victim's legs in the region of the knees and elevates them, making the victim's body pivot in his own safety belt. He then takes two steps upward, pulls the victim back against his chest and proceeds with resuscitation. This procedure is found to be desirable when pole conditions make impossible or difficult the use of the other approaches. It can be used either right or left as pole conditions make desirable. In the first approach to the side saddle position, some linemen prefer to slide their belt up the pole in the manner shown in order to prevent possible groin injuries. The first approach to the side saddle position is now demonstrated in slow motion to show the ease and comfort to both operator and victim. In the second approach to the side saddle position, the rescuer places his safety strap around the pole on a line with the victim's hips. The rescuer then reaches down, placing his right hand on the victim's right leg iron, and with his left hand keeps the victim's legs together and swings both legs up and over his head. This places the victim on the rescuer's safety strap in side saddle position with his legs over one side. The rescuer then proceeds with resuscitation. This position is preferred for conditions where it is best to swing the victim's legs over to the other side of the operator. Another approach to the side saddle position preferred by some linemen is to place the belt around the pole and to slide it up as they climb. This also tends to standardize the placing of the safety strap around the pole for each type of approach. On reaching the victim, the rescuer then reaches down and takes hold of the victim's legs, slightly below the knees, and elevates them. This clearly demonstrates the ease with which the operator pivots the victim's body with both legs over his head. The instructor is pointing out to the new man that the four practice approaches for getting the victim in position on the pole have been demonstrated, and that now they shall do a complete rescue showing how the whole operation is performed. Those who go to the aid of an electric shock victim on a pole must take all precautions for their own safety. Rescuers who are on poles shall descend carefully. Note that this rescuer trotted rather than ran. As he climbs and approaches the victim, he shall observe pole conditions. The rescuer, in the safest way to himself, shall proceed to free the victim from contact if this is necessary. He must do this in a safe manner that does not expose any unprotected portion of his body to contact with the victim's body or any nearby uncovered elements of the electrical system. 
It is important that the victim be reached and artificial respiration started as quickly as possible. But undue haste with the accompanying exhaustion of the rescuer may lessen his ability to do what is required when he reaches the victim. The assistant should be very deliberate, taking care not to interfere in any way with the operator. The assistant should make certain that neither the victim nor the operator is exposed to live conductors and should cover all possible sources of contact, making certain that line hose, blankets, and so forth have not shifted. During the practicing of complete rescues, the rescuer and his assistant shall wear rubber gloves and rubber sleeves. Certain types of pole construction and special position of the victim in actual cases will determine whether sleeves are an absolute necessity in each instance. The victim's climber shall be removed and also any tools from his belt to prevent possible injuries. In the meantime, the ground crew should be making preparations to receive the victim. To lower the victim to the ground, a fiber hand line of strength equivalent to at least one half inch diameter manila rope shall be used. Lines of 5 8 inch or 3 quarters inch are considered preferable. This line should be passed over a cross arm and not over cross arm braces, sharp edge surfaces, nor through a pulley. The line should be passed under the arms and secured, preferably in front, by at least three half hitches. As soon as the tackle has been adjusted, the assistant rescuer then removes the victim's safety belt and safety strap and the victim is then lowered to the ground. A minimum of 50 respirations is suggested before lowering. The assistant on the ground takes the weight of the victim on the hand line while the operator drops down below the victim. The assistant rescuer then places his hands on the back and belly of the victim and gives resuscitation until the first rescuer has moved down and out of the way. Whether or not the victim has fully recovered and is breathing when he reaches the ground, he should be laid prone at once and in proper position for the immediate administering of artificial respiration by the prone pressure method if this should become necessary. At this time, the victim must receive proper treatment for shock and must be kept warm. The lessons learned in this class are being reviewed and impressed upon the new man by the instructor who hopes the day will never come when it will be necessary to make use of this knowledge. The day did come within the year and the new man now knows the pole top method. It's a beautiful morning. The sun is shining. All nature is in tune. It is one of those perfect June days when mankind is at its best. But tragedy had visited Slim Lambert's home the night before. His small son had piled into the car with the rest of the kids. And when Slim closed the door, the boy's arm was broken. Slim hesitates to tell the men of his trouble. Slim knows the fault is his and suffers the anguish of the shock of the accident, the sufferings of his son, and the knowledge that he and he alone is to blame. The image of the little fellow as he saw him just before leaving the house is too sharply cut upon his mind for him to have any heart in the preparation for the day's work. Come on, Slim, let's go. With a well-trained line crew, good materials and equipment, as the truck pulls out, there is no outward sign that anything is wrong to the superintendent and his assistant. Despite all these safety measures, they only wish they were able to know what is going on in the minds of the men. The men in that silent comradeship and understanding that exists among linemen who work together, depending on each other in time of stress, hope that on the way to the job they will be allowed to share Slim's burden. Not one of them has forgotten the help that Slim has given him, but Slim is much too downhearted to speak of his misery, 
as the truck rolls through the suburbs and arrives on the job. At the job, Slim puts on his equipment and with a heavy heart, reluctantly goes to work. The new man has made his place in the gang. Arriving each morning with a clean shirt, he has earned the nickname of Whitey. Whitey and Sam are working with Slim today, and each has done his share in placing the rubber goods at the top of the pole. Whitey is again on his way up. Slim has often said that with rubber goods in place, you can't be wrong. But today, Slim can't keep his mind on the job. His thoughts are of his boy, back home in bed. Absent-mindedly, Slim bears a wire. Look out, look out. Watch your line hose, Slim. Slim's got it. Hey, Waddy, get him. You're on your way up. Gee, guys, look. Yeah, something's hot. Come on. Boy, it's a long way up some of those poles. Van, get the blanket ready. You, Mike, stand by with the lines to lower. Hey, you kid, get back there. Give us plenty of room. Joe, go telephone for a doctor. Slim isn't any featherweight, but Whitey knows his stuff and soon has Slim in position to perform pole top resuscitation. All right, Sam, take the bull line up. Never mind your sleeves. You're below the primaries. We'll send up the bucket. Pull that blanket straight, Joe. Although the victim and operator are well below the bare wire, Sam is taking no chances and his first act is to replace the line hose in its proper position to close the gap so there will be no second victim. Drop your bucket a little, Mike. That's it. Don't drop those spurs, Sam. Put the rope beyond the pole pin. Remember, Sam? That's it. Watch out for his head, Sam. Take it easy. Under that one. That's it. Okay. Now make those hitches good. That lineman must have been a boy scout. Look at him tie that knot. Oh yeah, three half hitches. Again, the simplicity of the three half hitches proves invaluable for a quick, safe, and efficient lowering tie. Okay, Mike, take your strain. Don't drop that belt, Sam. Heads up, he's coming down. Here he comes. Because of regular and conscientious drills, because Whitey and the rest of the gang knew what to do and did it, Slim is returning to health and enjoying recreation with his family and will go back to work after his strength is returned. What a welcome his old gang is going to give him. Well, there comes Slim. Any a sight for sore eyes, though. Slim, we missed you. Glad to see you back. Thanks, boss. But the one I want to see is Whitey, the guy who saved my life.
Every man who works above the ground should know the pole top method of resuscitation, lest we forget the method of pole top resuscitation is the same for all cases where it may be impossible to lay the victim in a prone position. Thank you.